Okay. Boom, we should be live. Let me just mute this real quick. Okay. All righty. Just a sec, everybody. Let me uh, share this around. Uh, two shakes and I'll be done. Um, those three of you that are watching right now, if you want to join in the Zoom uh, call, it's the same code as I used uh, for the last time I went on Zoom. It's always the same. So just use it and use it during the meeting. I'm live. Um, and that's really useful if you want to come in and ask questions uh, and to really sort of debate the book. Um, because, you know, Darkness at Noon is one of those books that we should probably talk about. Um, let me just send out the announcements real quick with the link and we should be good to go. One sec, everybody. Uh -huh. Okay. Ready. Um, is there a way for me to um, view the Zoom participants while the, um, the screen sharing is going? Let's find out. All right, and courses. Last one, and then we'll get started. Okay. Alrighty. And that's the last one. Okay. Outstanding. All righty. Let's get started. Um, so let's quickly talk about stop. Well, before we do that, let's, um, let's briefly chat. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you guys are doing better. Um, I know these times are troubling and things are getting bad. I was reading about um, Bojo, uh, Boris Johnson, the British PM going to the ICU, uh, which is uh, moderately terrifying, but um, we'll be fine, we'll be okay. And again, as I, as I mentioned in the office hours, um, please, please, please do not underestimate taking care of your mental well-being in addition to your physical well-being, like staying isolated, making sure people don't get sick is fantastic and good, but um, I would equally urge you to find ways to stay connected, uh, find ways to stay entertained, uh, find ways to stay sane. Um, I guess before we get started, um, brief sort of uh, content warning. Um, Look, this is this Stalin lecture is possibly the most depressing lecture of the course. Um, that and the Eichmann lecture are equally, you know, somewhat uh, tough subjects. And so I, I want to to preface that before we, we sort of get into it. Um, and that if you, if you need to to step out for a minute, that's perfectly fine. 
let me um let me copy the Zoom code into the YouTube chat as well, so that you guys can uh, can hop on in. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Whoops, I just posted that from my personal YouTube account. So, all right, well, now you know it. <laughs> um, okay, so seriously, you're playing the bongos right now. Right now, is, as soon as I start lecturing is when you're playing the bongos. <sighs> okay, all right, Zen mode. Um, so I guess quickly, let's, um, let's recap the class on the Weimar Republic because uh, we said quite a bit on the Weimar Republic and um, it bears mentioning purely because, you know, a lot of the processes that happen in transitioning the Weimar Republic to a country in Hitler's sort of image, for lack of a better word, is similar to what happens in Russia. So as we said, uh, Germany and Russia have a similar experience at the end of the war in that they both leave because of revolution at home. Essentially, their citizens decide they're going to stop. They're going, they don't want to support this war anymore. Uh, the old Prussian monarchy, the old sort of uh, vestige of Prussia, that older system is replaced with a modern style state, the Weimar Republic. Um, it is broadly supported by the German upper classes, the intelligentsia, as they start to be called. Um, it is, however, opposed by many of the returning veterans. Uh, you know, they're coming back from World War I and they view the, the government as illegitimate because they leave with one government and they come back and the government's completely different. So they, they, they don't view it as a legitimate sort of representative of the German government. Um, I think also it, it bears mentioning, you know, we talked a little bit about the stab in the back myth um, in our last lecture, but it bears uh, pointing out that the presence of the Weimar Republic leads to this idea that the German army is, is betrayed and stabbed in the back. Um, and it, it's a conspiracy theory that eventually evolves into uh, an anti sort of uh, anti-Semitic um, uh, slogan stabbed in the back is sort of this this uh, uh, siren call amongst these sort of early proto Nazis. It, it, it's not quite correct to call them Nazis at first, like in these early years of the late 1910s and early 1920s. Um, there is no real sort of Nazi party per se, but what there is is these potential future Nazis and they are quite common. Uh, and it bears saying again, uh, um, the conspiracy theory is false, but the truth here is largely irrelevant because what matters is what people believe because people's beliefs will inform their opinions more than the actual truth. Sorry, will inform people's behavior more than the actual truth. People don't make decisions based on the truth. People make decisions on what they feel is the truth. Um, and that is really important to understand, especially uh, in, um, in Thursday's class when we talk about how this powder keg of the Weimar Republic ends up as, um, uh, mind blank, um, ends up uh, with Hitler's rise to power. So, but to recap even further, um, we left Russia, if you guys remember, the Russian Civil War, three parts, uh, sorry, the Russian Revolution happens in three parts. At the end of the Russian Civil War, the final part where the Russians against all odds win the Civil War, Lenin dies. Uh, Lenin suffers a stroke. Lenin dies. And uh, because of that, um, you know, this leaves the Russian Revolution, 1923, I believe, uh, in a bit of a tough spot because how do you, how do you um, move beyond Lenin? You know, Lenin sort of carries the revolution forward through what seems almost to be force of will. Well, 
you know, in the short term, it means that the Russian Revolution needs a new leader. It needs a new uh, single, uh, you know, standard bearer for the movement. Uh, and this debate roughly occurs in an event called uh, the NEP. The NEP is essentially, it stands for the new economic policy. And the idea is that after the wartime economy that had been essentially continued after the end of World War I, because Russian, uh, the Russian World War, uh, World War I essentially transitions into the Russian Revolution and then the Civil War. So there is no real peacetime economy in Russia. There had not been one under the revolution. And therefore, the debate surrounding the new leader ends up coinciding with the uh, debate about the NEP. And so what are we going to do? Well, in this sort of massive party meeting, three candidates emerge. Three of them. Here are three unknown candidates. So what I'm going to do is I am going to um, recap their, um, their platforms. And in either the YouTube chat or on the Zoom call, you're going to tell me which ones you agree with the most and why. OK, so no names, no names. You're going to tell me which one you like the best. So here's the first one. Here's the first platform that you're going to that you're going to debate about, you're going to think about. Um, go something like this. Russia is struggling at the moment. Russia is having a, a really sort of hard time dealing with the realities of the post-war economy. Um, and part of the reason for that is that Russia is trying to do everything on its own. Russia is trying to you know, be a, a single economy trying to maintain every aspect of, of its production. But realistically speaking, that's not plausible. You can't really do that. You can't really expect to, to run your economy in a bubble. Because you can't expect to run your economy in a bubble, um, Russia needs friends. Russia needs people to trade with in order to thrive and survive. Um, the problem is that there are a bunch of countries that hates Russia's guts because Russia is a single solitary communist country in an ocean of capitalism. So the priority of the Russian Communist Party, according to this unnamed candidate, should be to spread socialism to all of the other countries of Europe. And that eventually, almost like little dominoes, that they're going to collapse one after the other after the other. So we won't have to do this alone. We can have friends in Germany and France and all of these other places, and we will all collaborate and share and trade with each other. That's how we can do better. That's platform number one. Here's platform number two. Platform number two says, okay, all of this is well and good. But the vast majority of the Russian population is not working class. The vast majority of Russia's population is peasants. It's members of the peasant class uh, that don't necessarily support us. And if we move too quickly in industrializing the country, as we're already starting to see in places like the Ukraine, um, Russia will collapse because we do not have the support of the majority of Russians. And so what we need to do is slow down. What we need to do is invite these peasants to be part of the process, like any good functioning, healthy democracy. And eventually, eventually, we will get where we need to be. That's the second one. So the first one says, spread the revolution far and wide, make, fr make friends with these new socialist countries because that's how we're going to survive. Option two says, um, we need to make good with the peasants before we can even think about spreading to all of these other countries. Um, the last one says the following. Did you just forget what happened? 
we just got out of a civil war in which all of us almost died, right? There, by no accounts should we be alive today. We won by a fluke. The other countries of the world, the countries that want us to see us fail, they're not going to take that risk again, right? They're not going to play around again. We need to be ready. We need to be strong because if we are not strong, they will crush us because that is the reality. The reality is that if, if the Russian state is not as powerful as it needs to be, they will destroy you. You know, it's not a conspiracy theory to say everyone wants to get you. Everyone is out to get you. Um, and that is what happens in the Russian Civil War. Remember, these, these monarchists and capitalists, they nearly killed us. That just happened just now, like, like two, two years ago. That we, we nearly almost all died. So we don't have time to wait for Germany and France and England to get with the program. We don't have time for the peasants to you know, slow down and catch up with us. No, we don't have time for this. We need to industrialize and become powerful as fast as humanly possible and perfect socialism in one country before we can even think of expanding it elsewhere. And if that means that our lives will be tough today, that is fine, but they will be better for our children and our children's children. And so here are your three platforms. The first one says, export the revolution. Let's make friends around the world because we were not meant to go with this alone. That's why we're struggling. The second one says, we need to work with the peasants who make up the majority of the Russian system in order to um, uh, sorry, mind block, uh, in order to, um, to be a functioning healthy society. Otherwise, you know, this is never going to work. It's never going to work if 60 plus percent of the population opposes us. And the last point says we don't have time for any of this. These foreign powers almost just destroyed us once. They're not going to make the same mistake again. We need to become as powerful as possible and perfect our system as, as quickly as possible in order to achieve where we need to be. So vote. How many votes for option number one? How many votes for option number two? And how many votes for option number three? If you're watching on YouTube, use the chat. If you are watching on Zoom, unmute your microphones and let me hear it. I'm um, talking. Two. Three. Well, okay. Now everyone went at once. <laughs> okay. One at a time on Zoom. Uh, let's go with, let me see who's watching. Wow. Underwhelming. Two people. Uh, all right. Uh, let's start with Megan. Um, I said three. Number three. So I'm going to, I got my handy notepad here. All right. So we have one, two, and three. So we have one vote for three. Uh, Nick. Two. Two. We have one vote for two. YouTube chat. Who you got? Crickets is the answer. <laughs> um, okay. All right, well, there's six people watching on YouTube and I got no uh, responses yet. So I guess I'll go in order. Now, usually, 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 um, classes respect the historical accuracy of what happens at the map and they pick option number three. Option number three is one Joseph Stalin. Uh, the first one, so, you know, good job, Megan. Good job for voting for Stalin. Well done. Um, option number one was uh, Trotsky. Um, yeah, Rachel Erla also says three in the chat. So three tends to be who people vote for. Um, yeah, option number one is Trotsky. Uh, much like in real life, uh, no one listened to Trotsky. Um, option number two was the most famous communist you've never heard of. It's a guy called... 
Nikolai Bukharin, uh, B-U-K-H-A-R-I-N. Um, he's actually more famous now because he is his theories, the sort of idea of like a, a peasant driven communism is gets really, really big with China, uh, especially the early days of Chinese communism, where they also had a bunch of peasants and they didn't really have a bunch of workers. And so they made it work with their uh, peasants. But option number three is Joseph Stalin. And he, bruff, uh, he roughly summarizes what he wants to say in a speech he gives. Uh, oh, damn. Okay. I, I had the, um, uh, the speeches here already. So let's go through all of the speeches given at the NEP. Uh, you know, be prepared. It's important. Um, so Trotsky's position is uh, the period of uh, the importance of the peasant economy will depend not only on our internal economic progress, but upon the progress of development taking place beyond the boundaries of Russia. The overthrow of the bourgeoisie in any one of the most advanced capitalist countries would very quickly affect the whole tempo of our economic development. So Trotsky's position is rather simple and rather clear. Trotsky says, uh, we need to start overthrowing the bourgeoisie. And many of these advanced capitalist countries, countries that have experienced the industrial revolution, because then they will help us. Broadly summarized, we're having difficulty because our system isn't designed to work in a bubble. We need to export the revolution to the industrialized countries of Western Europe in order to succeed. Uh, second point. Oh, we got more people. Howdy. Um, so position number two, Bukharin's position, is how much can we take away from the peasantry? To what extent and by what methods can we achieve industrialization? What are the limits of our industrialization and how shall we calculate uh, it? Sorry typo there, in order to arrive at favorable results. Currently, we are putting so severe pressure upon the peasantry that in our opinion, the result would be economically irrational and politically unallowable. The problem with sort of the Stalin and Trotsky route, according to Bukharin, is if you move too quickly, you are going to put so much stress on the peasant class economically, uh, uh, fiscally, that they, you will lose their support and all of the goodwill that you had, you're going to lose. Briefly summarized, our revolution is moving too quickly and it's putting too much on the shoulders of the peasants of Russia. And therefore we need to slow down the revolution. The last point, if you will, is the following. What if the revolution, the world revolution arrives too late? Is there any ray of hope for our revolution? According to this plan, there's only one prospect left for our revolution, to rot away while waiting for the world revolution. It is clear to me that the theory, the victory of socialism in one country is impossible, has proved to be an untenable situation. For Stalin, if we wait, they will crush us. They will kill us. They will destroy us. We do not have the time to do this. We cannot wait for revolution in other countries that might never come. We need to make our system work here in Russia before we even think about expanding, no matter what the cost is. Here is a recap of the three positions. If you want to take your screenshots, now is a good time to do it. Um, this is a broad summary of each of the positions represented at the NEP, and they're both compelling, and they're all compelling. But as we said, Stalin leaves the nap with the victory. Yes, I am very proud of my, uh, my Photoshop job done here. So this is here is Stalin, this here is Trotsky, this here is Bukharin. And in the hard line, Stalin, uh, the speech that he gives to the workers' conference after he is elected into power, gives a real indication of how Stalin views the world. In the hard line, he writes, it is sometimes asked whether it is not possible to slow down the tempo a bit, to put a check on the movement. No, comrades, it is not possible. The tempo must not be reduced. On the contrary, we must increase it as much as within our powers and possibilities. This is dictated to us by our obligations, 
to the workers and the peasants of the USSR. To slacken the tempo would mean falling behind. Those who fall behind are beaten, but we do not want to be beaten. No, we refuse to be beaten. One feature of the history of old Russia was the continual beatings that she suffered for falling behind, for her backwardness. She was beaten by the Mongols. She was beaten by the Turks. She was beaten by the Swedes. She was beaten by the Poles and Lithuanians. She was beaten by the British and the French capitalists. She was beaten by the Japanese. They all beat her for her backwardness, for her military backwardness, her cultural backwardness, her political backwardness, her industrial backwardness, her agricultural backwardness. She was beaten because to do so was profitable and could be done with impunity. Do you remember, sorry, there's a bit of a typo here. The words, let me actually fix that right now. Come on, come here. The words of the poet Nekrasov. You are poor and abundant, mighty and impotent, Mother Russia. These words of the old poet, they were well learned by those gentlemen. They said, uh, sorry, they beat her saying, you're abundant, so one can enrich oneself at your expense. They beat her saying, you're poor and you're impotent, so you can be beaten and plundered with impunity. Such is the law of the exploiters, to beat the words and the weak. It is the jungle law of capitalism. You are backward, you are weak, therefore you are wrong. Hence, you can be beaten and enslaved. You are mighty, therefore you are right. Hence, we must be wary of you. This is why we must no longer lag behind. We have overthrown capitalism and power is in the hands of the working class and we shall defend our independence. Do you want our socialist fatherland to be beaten and to lose its independence? If you don't want this, you must put an end to its backwardness in the shortest possible time and develop genuine Bolshevik tempo in building up its socialist system of the economy. There is no other way. This is why Lenin said during the October Revolution, either perish or overtake and outstrip the advanced capitalist countries. We are 50, no, 100 years behind the advanced countries. We must make good this distance in 10 years. Either we do it or they crush us. That is what our obligations to the workers and the peasants of the USSR dictate to us. Now, this speech is a perfect encapsulation of how Stalin thinks. So in our last, well, class, uh, you were supposed to have watched a, a little movie called Max. And um, now Zoom called people especially, uh, unmute the mics, uh, thoughts on the movie? before we move on. I thought it was a good movie. Okay, all right. And um, what did, what was um, curious about its portrayal of, you know, not to spoil it, since you've all watched it now, uh, one Adolf Hitler in the movie. What was different this time? I mean, this was like, I feel like the portrayal of him was him like before he was actually like the Hitler that we know him as so they almost like I feel like he was portrayed in a neutral light before he started um doing the the political speeches okay all right he seemed impotent to me uh not not like you know okay physically, I was about to say like metaphorically in what just way? Uh, like he just seemed like uh grasping at straws like he was just looking for anything and he found something and would you agree with the following statement Hitler is an emotional dude in the movie Max. Yeah. yeah. Extremely, right? Yeah. Okay. This is fundamentally the difference between Stalin and Hitler. Hitler is, even when he is much older and during the Reich, Hitler and Nazism is a, a theory of the world that is purely predicated on emotion. Remember what I said when I talked about early Nazism, that this doesn't have to make sense. This is not logical. This is not about logic. 
logic is what you would find under the communists. But they took it to the other extreme. Stalin is all logic all the time, emotions and morals be damned. He's rather famous for saying that morals are a luxury and we do not have them. Because if, if there is a one sentence that purely encapsulates Stalinist thinking, it's the phrase by any means necessary. Whatever Stalin can do, because again, Stalinism is predicated on the idea that if socialist countries are not as powerful and united and have not perfected their economic system as much as possible domestically, then they will be crushed. And that the Russian revolution in the civil war won by a fluke. I mean that that's not gonna happen again. And so Russia needs to be, needs to be made powerful by any means necessary, purely dictated by the logic of growth. What does that mean? Well, in the immediate aftermath of taking power, there are people at the NEP, at this debate, this gigantic debate over the future of Russia that did not support Stalin. These people must be purged from the party. What you're witnessing here is one of the few pictures of the Stalinist purges. All of these people did not support Stalin at the NEP, and all of these people would be purged from the party. But purged from the party does not just mean kicked out and now they have to find a factory job. Purged from the party means exiled to an archipelago of forced labor camps called gulags. And gulags are a perfect example of Stalinist thinking. Why would we kill you? Why would we execute you when we can work you to death and extract labor? This is not, gulags were not concentration camps the way not the, the Nazi concentration camps were. You know, the Nazi concentration camps were designed to essentially kill and dehumanize as many people as possible, or at least as many Jews and dis political dissidents as possible. That's not what the gulags are for. The gulags were specifically designed to extract as much labor as humanly possible at the lowest possible cost. The biggest irony of of Stalin is that for all of his railing against the ills of capitalism, you know, Stalin was the worst boss of them all in that he also ran his gulags a bit like a business, a bit like those same god awful working conditions that we saw in the Industrial Revolution that drove Marx so mad, correctly so, to be clear, rightly so. But this is the thing that makes Stalin unique. Stalin's purges, and he does, um, uh, you know, they purge everyone from the party that was loyal to either Trotsky or Bukharin. And what they use is this thing called the show trial. Uh, these sort of fictionalized fake trials where someone is accused of some crime in order to be condemned to years and years and years of hard labor. Now I want to uh, pause this for a minute to tell a story that purely encapsulates Stalinist thinking. Because Stalinist thinking is emotionalist to, the, to a point of fault. And there is this story that was told to me about Stalin by a graduate professor of mine years and years and years ago that stuck with me because of the quandary that it asks and what Stalin was willing to do. Now, there is a bit of a common misconception about how Hitler invades, how comes to invade Russia. So the story is, if you've heard of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, signed between Hitler and Stalin, essentially Stalin does not want to spend money on an army. He doesn't want to invest in you know, arming uh, an army when he could, he would rather spend that money doing the sort of development and industrialization of Russia that he keeps talking about. 
And because of that, he signs a, a pact of non-aggression between with him and with uh, Hitler. Essentially, the two countries agree to not fight each other. So Stalin knows what Hitler's plan is, but he also knows that he would rather not fight Hitler. And so they agree to divvy up Poland when Hitler invades, when Hitler invades Poland from one side, Stalin invades Poland from the other with limited resources, but he's, they're both able to divvy up Poland rather quickly. And this frees up Hitler to turn around and face France. However, it may shock you to learn that Hitler was not a man of his word, and that as soon as his invasion of Russia uh, of uh, France was done, he turned right around, and broke the pact, and invaded Russia. And if you're Stalin, well, now you're screwed because you don't have an army. And here you are facing the best equipped, most advanced army the world had ever seen to that point. And contrary to popular belief, Hitler does not invade in the winter. Hitler invades in July. People often make this mistake. Hitler invades in July. And he's not doing so on horseback. He's doing so with tanks. Now, there are lots of ways that Stalin could have solved this problem. It also seems rather clear to me that if Hitler wins in Russia. Hitler wins, period. It is widely accepted to be true that if Hitler wins in Russia, he's able to combine the sheer amount of people that live in Russia with the uh, equipment that Germany is able to pump out, that Hitler suddenly has an unstoppable, an unstoppably large army and Man in the High Castle becomes a documentary. So the stakes are rather high, and Stalin has no army to beat back uh, Hitler. So what does he do? Uh, people on the Zoom call, unmute your microphones. Uh, who has ever seen a tank up close before? Me. Not me. Okay. I have not. <laughs> you have not. One person has seen a tank up close. Now, would you say a tank is a big machine or a small machine? It's a gigantic machine. It's a gigantic <laughs> machine, all right? So let's say you're traveling down the road. Right? You're traveling down you know, George Street, downtown New Brunswick, all right? What sort of formation do the tanks have to travel in in order to maintain you know, ranks? A convoy. A convoy, but like, is it side by side? Is it- Oh you know, no, triangle? single file. Single <laughs> file, all right? They have to yeah. go single file, all right? So imagine here is this convoy Tanks in the front, soldiers in the middle, support vehicles in the back. That's usually like how it goes. And they're all traveling in single file down this dirt road in the middle of rural Russia on their way to Moscow. Now imagine, let me see, who's, who's on the call? Who can I pick on? Uh, okay, there's two of you on this phone call. Yeah, Jamelia in the YouTube chat says, tanks are huge. They are huge. Um, now here's the thing. Let's say... Uh, um, Megan and Nick, you guys are Russian soldiers, all right? Congratulations, you've joined the army, and um, you're crouching on the side of the road, and you have a peasant there with you because the peasant has shown you where the tanks are. So there you are, the three of you at the side of the road, and sure enough, down the road, you see this huge plume of dust, and the tanks roll down the road. And as soon as the tank comes in front of you, you both take the peasant and chuck him into the treads of the tank. Not under, into. What do you think happens to that peasant? Nothing good. Nothing probably, good. Probably <laughs> dies. <laughs> probably dies rather painfully, right? But what happens to the tank? It keeps going, I imagine. Does it keep going? There's a, there's a human inside the treads, in the machinery. I feel like it would take a lot of bodies to. <laughs> Is that no. all it takes? One peasant to take down a tank? <laughs> who, who would win? All of Europe versus one peasant. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, but this is what they did. They, they would throw these peasants into the sides of the, tr the tank. And like a giant, you know, I hope you guys are not eating as I described this. 
as a giant sort of meat balloon, you know, the, the peasant essentially bursts and gets gunk and guts and everything all over the inside of the tank. And the tanks uh, treads essentially, they jam because all sorts of bits of, of human get inside the tank, right? And the tank has to stop because like if any rib like shoots inside the engine, that engine is busted. But because it's the first tank in the single file, what happens? It stops the whole convoy. Stops the whole convoy. And so here you are, you know, German tank gunner, you know, open up the lid, crawl out, look at what's going on in the treads of the tank, vomit, and then proceed to like clean up the tank as best you can, you know, cleaning up people gunk outside of this tank. You clean up, you're all ready to go. You spent like two hours doing this. And then a couple miles down the road, it happens again. And again, and again, and again, and again. Why? Because Stalin is playing for time. Well, what is the best thing that Russians can do in this case? Wait for winter. And so all, all Stalin needs to do is delay Hitler until winter to stand a chance at winning. And so Stalin does this awful, awful thing. But it gets better. It gets better. Because if you're Stalin and you want to maximize the person in tank ratio, right? Do you want big people or small people? <laughs> big people. <laughs> you know, no, you don't want big people because then their legs are going to fall out. You want shorter, smaller people. Now, what is the, uh, the fastest, most time-honored way of making really, really small humans? Oh, the gulag. <laughs> oh, not the gulag. Uh, you, you, can, you can pump them out every like nine months or so. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I'm, that, that's what happens. You, you don't want babies because, you know, babies won't do the job. Eh, Ten-year-olds. Yeah, yay tall. All right? That way. Okay, I'm sorry. Are you guys expecting moral rectitude from Joseph Stalin? <laughs> like this, it's this just is logical to use ten-year-olds. <laughs> well, okay, here's the thing: you could always make more. Number one, oh <laughs> they're a renewable resource. Number two, you're not going to do this with the point of of throwing a, a, something that's alive in there is that it bursts. If you throw like a rock in there, it's just going to shoot right back out. Right? You need something that's that's flexible and bendy you know like a person but you don't want to throw an animal in there not because like hitler loves animals but because that's food you're throwing in there um and so you want something that is an easily renewable resource that you can keep throwing in there and if i sound callous because congratulations this is how stalin thinks but here's the thing here's the thing the the, the most messed up thing about this story is that it works. Hitler's army is delayed until winter. And by the time they reach the big urban centers of Russia, Petrograd, as we call it, St. Petersburg, Moscow, and Stalingrad, they reach these places in the middle of winter with no food, no easily accessible supply lines. And these famous sieges, the siege of Stalingrad in particular, is very, very bad. But Hitler underestimates the Russian capacity for pain. These Russians, by, by strength or by obligation by their superiors, were willing to eat tree bark, their shoes, their pets, and each other before surrendering to the Nazis. And at the heart of winter, Hitler turns around, goes back. And that is when a bunch of angry Russians chase Hitler all the way back to Berlin. We forget this. Stalin beats the Allies to Berlin. He beats um, the Americans and the Brits to Berlin. Because remember, in all of, while all this is going on, the Allies are coming you know, have landed in Normandy and are coming up through Italy, okay? Trying to, to, you know, tackle Hitler in Berlin. But Stalin beats us there. 
Now, bonus points. We're going to talk about this next week as well. Um, where are most concentration camps that Hitler makes located? Does anyone know? Where's Auschwitz, for example? No one? Nobody know? Anyone want to Google it real quick? They're all in Poland. Most of the concentration camps are in Poland. Now, geographically speaking, Poland is between Russia and Germany, which means that Stalin actually frees most Jews in the concentration camps. And Stalin sees what, or at least the Russians see, what Hitler has done. So here's the question. Does Stalin save the world? And if he does, if this, is, if this theory of the world is correct, is Stalin right to do what he does in order to say, in order to beat the Nazis? Hmm? Think about it. Is Stalin right? I don't think so. I feel like you this is so? a trick question. You just want us to say that we think Stalin is great right now. <laughs> no, not at all. I, I fucking hate Stalin. But we're going to talk about Stalin a lot in Darkness of Noon. But my point is, if, if this is how Stalin views the world, right? Stalin views the world as a world where morals are a capitalist fiction, for lack of a better word, right? Stalin views these these rules that we set ourselves as things that prevent us to do from doing what is necessary. And Stalin views this act as, as being necessary to save the world, all right? And it, it's important for you to understand that perspective because otherwise you're not gonna understand Stalin. So this is what I mean when I say Stalin is all logic all the time, morals be damned. This is not a story about having good ethics. It's about was Stalin correct in doing this? And if your choices are Hitler wins World War II or a few Russian peasants get thrown into tanks, you know which one Stalin in the pick every day of the week. This is how Stalin understands, I guess, I don't want to say the way Stalin understands the world because that's a little reductive. It's more like this is how Stalin understands how the necessities work. And it's just an extension of, of all of the things he's done in other circumstances, right? He's done this exact same thing. You know, it's the same logic that leads him to make the gulags, right? You know, extract labor from these people and make a more united Russia. Morals be damned. And here is what I'll say. This is the last positive thing I'll say about Stalin today. Stalin is able to drag Russia from a backwater of Europe, from a country in which poverty abounded to nuclear superpower in 30 years. It is a rise that would not even be matched by the, you know, exponential, uh, exponentially huge rise of China in our lifetime. But that's the closest equivalent. Stalin drags Russia into the 21st century. And he does it in the most brutal and authoritarian way possible. But he does it. And so I ask the question again, does Stalin save the world? Because you know, it, it, it's, it's worth debating about who this guy is, especially in light of, let me grab it, this book that you all allegedly read, right? Let's talk darkness at noon. Um, there's only two of you, so 50-50. Who wants to uh, say something about darkness at noon first? Um, it was, I mean, it was interesting. I liked it. I definitely, I liked the first book we read better. You really liked Storm of Steel better? Wow. I did, yeah. I was not expecting that. Nick, I assume you have the opposite opinion? 
Oh, I hated Storm of Steel. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I wasn't crazy about Storm of Steel either, but like on a on a scale. <laughs> wow, I'm shocked because like Darkness and Noon is my my opinion the better of the th- as the best of the three. Um, that gives me so much hope for the next one. <laughs> oh no! Wow, <laughs> I actually like Darkness and Noon though. Uh, actually, I mean, I mean, I thought it was really interesting, like the concept and the way like they wrapped everything up, where he just was like very um like self-reflective and just like completely kind of changing his mindset seeing like all the flaws of the communist party well i mean well let's talk about this for a minute because in darkness you let's start off with like there are three main characters in darkness right the rubishov ivanov and glatkin and it is also fair to say that all three of them are bastards (laughs) bastards <laughs> for a different reason right none of these people are good people <laughs> right oh like and it's heavily implied and i don't know if you if you guys got this um it is heavily implied that uh, rubishov is being tortured you guys got this right yeah oh, yeah, yeah okay i mean it's pretty much right? said <laughs> well yeah but but like <laughs> There is a, you know, whenever he's complaining about his toothache, it's because they're pulling his teeth out. That's why he has a toothache. It's not like he, oh, you know, he has poor dental hygiene while in a Russian prison. It's because they're, they're actually like torturing him. Also, and so, like, at the end of the book, they say it kind of, they pretty much are like, um, like when he when he um confesses to or whatever uh what was yeah. the other guy's name he pretty much says like oh yeah like he confessed because we tortured him well i mean there's it's it's completely shameless but i think the the the, the problem is not so much that that rubishov i mean no because i'm not going to say it that way because that's going to make me seem like an awful human being uh, the, the problem is not so much that that rubishov admits to this under torture the problem is that Rubishov, on some degree, believes himself to be guilty, right? Like, this is part of the issue. Rubishov, it, it's sort of difficult because part of the, the joy of this novel is that, you know, again, I, I, I mentioned this, if, if there is any sort of book that this reminds me of, it's 1984. And it ends in a rather similar way. To 1984. I don't know if you guys ever read that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you haven't? No, I, I haven't. didn't read it. Okay. Um, uh, those of you who have not read it, if you're watching this and you have not read it, there are few, there are a few things that you should read at least once in your lifetime. That everyone at least once in their lifetime reads, and 1984 is one of those things. It's, it's not a long book. I, I personally read it, I think I was a junior in high school when I read it, uh, but it, it is one of those things that everybody reads, and you absolutely should. Um, You're but supposed it's to in high school to... curriculums. What's up? You're supposed to in high school curriculum, but uh, my teacher that I had was like, we're going we're gonna to read um, Brave New World instead, so that's Ooh, what we that's did. That's also pretty good. Um, yeah. Okay. okay, so here's the thing, here's the thing. I will, you know, parentheses, we're getting a little off topic here. Brave New World is more topical, right? It's more topical for today's times because of the way it talks about entertainment and narcotics sort of dulling our political, um, I don't want to say political... Like it, it causes us to be apathetic and not informed because the people in Brave New World are so busy, you know, watching entertainment and getting high and not being uh, super involved in, you know, sort of ignoring the world crumbling around them. Um, and that's all well and good. However, in terms of sort of poignant political narrative, you know, Darkness and Noon in 1984 represent two sides of the same coin. And the problem with Darkness and Noon is that this is a real story, um, or at least, so Kessler um, has friends that he loses in the purges. And so the character of Rubishov is like 
four of his friends put together in one character. That's why Rubishov has done so many things, uh, because in fact, Rubishov is four different people. Um, and all right, let's start with who is the first person to die in this book? Is it Rubishov? That's what I thought. It is not. Ivanov is oh, the first uh, one to die. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot. All right? Yeah. Ivanov is the first one to die in this book. And what's fascinating is that Ivanov and Rubishov are both sort of these old guard communists that had grown up under Lenin. But Gletkin becomes essentially a mouthpiece for Stalin, who is, who is called number one in the book. But I mean, I hope you guys understood that that was Stalin, right? Like it was, it was pretty clear who that was. He says, you know, I have the, I attacked my copy of Darkness at Noon with a highlighter, that was not obvious. Um, but there is this line that Ivanov says, but he's speaking as a Stalinist, where he says, the greatest criminals in history are not of the type Nero and Fouché, but the type Gandhi and Tolstoy. Gandhi's inner voice has done more to prevent the liberation of India than any British gun. To sell oneself for 30 pieces of silver is an honest transaction, but to sell oneself to one's own conscience is to abandon all mankind. History is a priori amoral. History has no conscience. If you want to conduct history according to the rules of a Sunday school, you leave everything as it is. You know the stakes in this game, and yet here you talk about the people's whimpering. You know, this is a, every single person in this book, again, reiterate, is an awful, awful, awful person for different reasons. There's a story, you know, all of Rubishov's uh, mistakes and errors are told through these flashbacks, right? Through, you know, this flashback that he has with, um, uh, with Richard. In, in, um, it's unclear whether it's London or it's Berlin. Uh, there's you know, reasons to think that it's both. There's the story of, of how he treats little Livy, and then the story of him and Arlova. Uh, and he treats all of these, you know, Rubishov, the main character, treats all of these people in his life extremely poorly to the point that all three of them are dead um, for different reasons. But exclusively his fault. You know, the story of Little Lovey I found to be particularly tragic. Um, you know, this, this, this sort of fun-loving guy that ends up killing himself because um, Rubishov kicks him from the party. But what's fascinating is the whole point of him being on trial is that based on his job, who do you think Rubishov supports at the net? Based on what he does for a living. What do you mean? I'm, I'm... Like of the, of the three candidates at the NEP, right? Oh, Trotsky. Think... <laughs> You're right. He's clearly a Trotskyist, right? Yeah. Like this is, you know, his whole, you know, Rubashov's whole job is to go around Europe and, you know, support these communist uh, uprisings all over Europe. He's clearly a Trotskyist. That's why he's on trial, because he was not a Stalinist the way his friend Ivanov was. Um, but if they're all awful people that should not be imitated, you know, I guess this is the part of the class, well, so this reveal is a lot more effective when done in person, but we make do. Um, this is the part of the class where I reveal that I have been less than honest with all of you. And I reveal that I have been teaching you history the way Rubishov, Ivanov, and Glutkin learned history. And if you think about it, it should make a lot of sense. We started off in the very first class, if you remember. What did we do on the board? What was the window graph about? What did we divide our societies into? What was the window graph all about? 
Um, that was was not when we did the um, when we divided it between like the urban rich. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. What what do we call these people? What 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 groups? What do we call these groups? Classes or classes, right? Yeah. That was like one of the first things we did is we looked at European history through the lens of class, and we did that starting in lecture one all the way until today, and looking at history exclusively through the lens of class led us to make some pretty troubling assertions. We, for example looking at history through the lens of class, made the assertion that slavery was more of an economic phenomenon than it was a racial one. Did we or did we not when we looked at mercantilism? When we looked at the French Revolution, we turned the story of chaos in the streets as a grand conspiracy theory between the urban rich and the rural rich. When we looked at the uh, First World War, we did not look at it through the lens of nationalism, we looked at it through the lens of imperialism. When we looked at the Russian Revolution, our focusing on the big picture, on building this house of cards that we've built for ourselves and our view in the history, led us to indirectly condone some pretty awful shit. We condoned Killing workers in order to help workers. We did that. You did that. If you if you voted for it, own it. We elected to kill the czar and his family, including the baby. We voted for that. If you voted for that, own that, right? We voted to say throwing children into tanks is an acceptable solution to the I'm being invaded problem. We did that. You did that. If you voted for that, own it. And I don't mean that to, to shame you, to put you at, at ease. Sorry, to, to put you not at ease. The point is that it was rather easy for me to inculcate that kind of thinking in all of you. It took me two months, three months. That's it. It took me three months to from dividing Europe into classes, into throwing children into tanks is an acceptable solution to resolving my, you know, I'm being invaded problem. And that should terrify you. Like the fact that I don't, you know, no one really protested when I said, you know, let's go kill the czar and his family. No one did. No one in the chat of you know, on YouTube said, whoa, 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 why are we agreeing to this? Not a one of you did that, right? No one. Why? Because on some level, you agreed that this was, it was at least a logical thing to do. And that's the problem. This is the problem of Stalinist thinking. And when we take it to its extreme in a book like Darkness and Noon, what you realize is that every single person in this book is not a role model is not someone who you should aspire to be, someone you should aspire to, to talk like, to act like. The people in this book not just only do awful things, but they say awful things too. And they justify it through their, you know, edgelord interpretation of what communism is. And again, I was taking you all down the same path. And the problem is not that you guys didn't agree with it. The problem is that many of you did. That should be the scary part of this lecture. This is what I mean when I said at first that this is one of the scariest lectures of the class. I don't particularly enjoy it, but until, you know, from when I started teaching this class to today, I have yet to have a class. I had students, individual students say, hey, no, I don't want to vote for this. But I have yet to have a class actively say, what you are asking us to vote for is morally reprehensible. Never, it's never happened. And, you know, there is a phenomenal movie that I highly recommend. I feel like half of my live streams involve movie recommendations. It's called um, uh, Die Welle, and it's based on a real story out of a California high school in the 1950s and 60s. 
I believe, uh, was it 1950? I believe 57, like late 50s, early 60s. Um, in this high school in California, this class tells their history professor that they don't believe that Nazism could ever thrive in America, especially with the new generation, because we know better. And this history professor takes it as a bit of a challenge. And over the course of a semester, turns all of them into little Nazis by sort of slowly skewing the way he teaches. And I believe it, you know, this rather famous story, and I believe he ends up in prison at the end of it. Um, but I did Wait, not do something called? that. Uh, Die Vela. Hold up. Let me see if I can. Hold up. Uh, share screen. Uh, uh, how do I? Hold up. Stop share. I'm back. New share. Desktop one. Okay. Share. Okay. Welcome. Uh -huh. It's called D. Bella. Here it is. The wave. It's also called. Oh. I don't know if you guys can see this. I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very good movie. And it's based on a real uh, story, which is found. Hold up. Where is it? Hold up. I'll find it. Here we go. Based on Ron Jones's social experiment called the third wave. Sorry. There we go. 1967. Sorry. So a little bit later. Um, but yeah, it was essentially... The students in that class could not figure out how the how the Germans could so willingly accept Hitler, and so he made his own version of the Nazi Party in this class. And suddenly, these students called the third, you know, joined the third wave as a youth group. Suddenly, became little fascists. Like this is this is a recorded thing that happened. Uh, let so me... he just did that as a social experiment. He's not actually a fascist, but he managed to make a whole class fascist. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, again, how, how different is that from what I just did? True. Like on some level, on some level, right? Like there's only two of you on the Zoom call, but there's a lot of you um, uh, in the YouTube chat watching this. On some level, and don't bullshit me, on some level, who here did not see the logic of everything that I talked about? in the Russian Revolution class and uh, you know what I just talked about with Stalin, right? Like there's multiple sort of interpretations of, of what happens here and why, but fundamentally, fundamentally, you all agreed, right? Again, no one stopped me. No one said, uh, yo, you know, this is messed up. I really don't want to even think about this. You know, in, in the YouTube chat, they're saying we became Marx little communists. Oh, on some level, yeah, you did, right? And you know, no one really questioned it because I was the person in authority and you could not think of me being perhaps an unreliable narrator of this story. You accepted my word as gospel and that was part of the problem. And so going forward, you know, we are going to approach history a little differently. And, you know, I, I hope you can draw the, the lesson from, from today's lecture. You know, the, the, I, I have been setting this lecture up for three months. Um, I hope you can accept the, the lesson from today's lecture, which is just because an authority figure says it doesn't mean that it is true or that that authority figure is not a real, or that uh, is not an unreliable narrator, an unreliable teller of the story, right? And so going forward, when we talk about history, we're gonna do it a little bit differently. We're gonna focus a little bit less on the class uh, and classes, a little more on the people themselves, the individuals and their actions and their behaviors, right? We, we have to sort of stop pretending like individual choices don't matter and that economic considerations are the only things that matter. They do, right? I, I am not, don't let the takeaway from this be the opposite experience. 
that class is completely unimportant and we should never talk about it. Of course not. But it cannot be the only thing we talk about. It cannot be the only consideration that we think of when we talk about history. History is sort of this, this comp, sort of this complex thing that has many facets and we have to look at all of them. You know, uh, Rachel in the chat says, uh, I just thought you really like teaching communism. I do, but not for the reasons that you think. You know, uh, I, I understand that my owning a, I just have it, hold up, hold up. I understand that my ownership of a pocket communist manifesto does not help my case here, uh, but I am actually not a closet communist. Um, in, in, Dreamy in the chat says, what was necessarily wrong with this view though? Eggs need to break in order to make a good omelet. But when those eggs are people, you can't be so callous about breaking. You understand what I'm saying? It, it, it is this kind of, I'm not saying that this thing, kind of thinking is, is necessarily wrong all the time. What I'm saying is that this kind of thinking is dangerous, that it leads to poor callous decision-making when taken to its inevitable extreme, um, the way the characters in darkness take it to their inevitable extremes. And their ideological, their political, their social extremes. And that you cannot get wrapped up in your own view of the world that you become oblivious to the world around you. And I think that's one of the lessons of Darkness and Noon. And that's why I highly recommend that every single person read this book at least once, um, more so than Storm of Steel, because this, this book is so deeply quotable that there's so much here that you can use both in your papers and in other classes, um, I have, I am one of those persons that has no problem with you guys using stuff I say for other classes. Um, my point being is, don't be a Stalin. Like there is a middle ground between being Hitler, all emotion all the time, logic be damned, um, right? But the solution to that is not being the opposite. The solution to that is not being a Stalin either. Because what ends up happening is that you know, like the horseshoe theory of politics, they start looking like two sides of the same coin, right? They start making, coming to similar conclusions from drastically different points of view. So for example, rather famously, both Stalin and Hitler come to con the idea of concentration camps, but they come to that point completely differently because Stalin is not there saying, you know, we need to get rid of every single Jew in our society. Stalin is saying we need work camps. And so he just decides to fill them. Um, it's a, it's a deeply troubling understanding of how history and politics works. And, I, and I, again, I, I hope that the conclusion here is to think critically about what people in authority tell you. And that, again, part of this was that you assumed that I was a reliable narrator, that I was you know, not out here trying to sell you on a point of view. And the problem is that you guys bought it. That you guys, you know, you ate it up. And if this is an issue, this is a problem. And I'm not expecting to solve that in this class. I think that that's that, you know, rather naive of me to expect to do that. But to make you at least aware that this is a thing that happens and that happens often. So I, I think I'm gonna to end this here. Um, you know, let you reflect on your own existential anxiety uh, for a hot minute. So I am going to close this off here. Uh, again, again, uh, tomorrow is the extra credit Zoom lecture at six for 1917. Um, that is not gonna be streamed to YouTube. So if you want to participate, I will be taking attendance for that. Um, you will need to join the Zoom call. All right, that's gonna be right at six. You have 24 hours to watch 1917. Just letting you guys know, uh, it is not available on any streaming services. So you're gonna have to rent or buy it, but it'll be worth it because it was very, very good. Um, any questions from anyone? No? All righty. Well, in that case, I will see you guys either tomorrow or Thursday. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Oh, wait, I actually lied. I have a question. I have a question. You do have a lot. Okay, let me hear it.
Okay. Um, do you know when you're going to be like submitting grades? Because I know like I have like a lot of assignments. Um, like okay. Submitted. So the problem is that they've been piling up rather quickly because we, you know, you guys have been submitting assignments like every two, three days. I'm yeah. working on it. The problem is that yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I don't want to click submit until I have all of the grades, at least for one category done. Right. So yeah, like I have fine. like, I'm just like, yeah, they will get done. Don't worry. I'm working on it. Yeah. I just right? wanted to just make like, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, no worry. They're being graded. Relax. Okay. okay. We'll be good. All right. No questions. We good. We bueno. All right. Is there an announcement for the Zoom call 1917? Um, I sent an announcement about it, I think yesterday night uh, or was it Saturday night? I don't remember precisely when. I think it was yesterday night. Um, and the, the code to join the Zoom call is always the same. Uh, so, you know, copy it from uh, it's here. It's six three one zero nine zero zero two seven eight. It's always going to be that code to join my my Zoom calls. All right. So you know tomorrow night six p.m. like five fifty five. Get on the Zoom call and I'll take attendance for that. Okay. All righty. I will catch you guys out tomorrow Thursday. You guys take it easy. All right. Bye.